Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Jan Shoshkataishvili. He is an assistant professor at Arizona State University in cybersecurity. He is one of the world's best hackers. He is a previous team captain of Shellfish, one of the highest ranked hacking groups in the world. He's also founder of the Order of the Overflow, a mysterious entity that hosts DEF CON CTF, stands for Capture the Flag, and it is something we're going to dive into quite a bit in our conversation. Thank you so much, Jan, for being here on the podcast. Happy to be here, Katie. How did you get into this world of hacking? Um, I got in pretty early. Uh, so when I was about six years old or so, uh, my grandmother gave me a book uh, called Professor Fortran's Encyclopedia. And this was a book uh, back in Russia. It was published for um, kids to learn about computing. And it just took kids through what is a computer, various concepts uh, in this comic book fashion. Had a Professor Fortran, of course. Uh, Fortran is also the name of a programming language. Um, that was the the kind of pun there. <laughs> um, it. it had a cat named X and a caterpillar <laughs> named Caterpillar and um, a bird named Bird. Uh, and so th they kind of explored the computing world together. Uh, and then, then they culminated in um, learning how to code uh, in, in BASIC. And uh, this was all on a book. There weren't really personal computers around, uh, and definitely not in Russia. And so for a while, I would just uh, ditch class, um, you know, in elementary school, early elementary school, and I would ditch class, and I'd hide uh, in the stairwell, and I would just read this book over and over, cover to cover. <laughs> and then uh, eventually I got a chance to, you know, write some simple programs on the mainframe at my mom's work. Wow. Um, what did your mom do? My mom did uh, basically what is now would be seen as like database programming. Okay. But back then it was a branch of math. In, okay. In, uh, was that, is that a, was a, at the time a well respected role for women? Um, or, or was it sort of a, a gender divide? Was it only women who were doing the computing in, in that space at the time in Russia? From what I remember, her department was uh, largely women. But. I don't know if there was a gender divide. I don't know enough about that to answer, really. Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, the... There's some more visibility around that that trend, in a, at least in American history, yeah. around NASA and uh, a lot of women of color who were uh, really the ones computing yeah. in the background for, for a lot of oh, absolutely. space flights. Yeah, yeah um, you know, the, the early... I gave a talk yesterday to uh, the university here, um, to their cybersecurity university club. University of Cincinnati? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I visited yes. their cybersecurity club. And I start. I like to put a historical basis for my talks. And I was introducing the concept of program analysis, which I guess we'll get to later. Uh, but in introducing this concept, you know, you start with like Charles Babbage and so forth, the, the um, creator of the Babbage analytical engine. And, and this was in the 1800s. Yes. And it was one of the first things that's kind of recognizable as a modern computer, uh, or uh, you know, on the way to a modern computer. And then you very quickly uh, start talking about Ada Lovelace, mm -hmm. and the first, uh, you know, computer programmer, someone yes. who wrote uh, programs for for um, Babbage's computer. She's also the first computer program analyzer. Yes. Um, so she uh, had this amazing analysis of computer software uh, as it ran, or as it would hypothetically run in a hypothetical uh, analytical engine. It's speaking of favorite children's books. I have three little kids, and they love Ada Twist Scientist, which is based on Ada Lovelace. Oh, that's great! Yeah, Ada Marie. Ada Marie said not a word till the day she turned three, and she, and it's all about how she is has a scientific mind, not necessarily mm -hmm. a, a literary mind, and how she explores her world. Um, anyway, since we're, we started with children's books, so yeah. so yeah, okay, so. When you're introducing students to some of these concepts, you're walking them through the history and, and the different sort of perhaps untold or unseen voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's important to have that grounding. Um, I mean, it's that early history is peppered with names that, you know, while we 
recognize Ada Lovelace. I think people recognize um, Grace Hopper. You know, they don't quite realize how impactful these people were. Um, and it's important to surface that yeah. uh, so that when students learn about cybersecurity, they understand that they are not just jumping in uh, in a specific instance in time. Yes. They're really uh, participating in a long continuum of uh, people getting at the very heart of computing. And that's at its core what cybersecurity is. Yeah. It's digging into the very, very fundamentals of um, computer science, of computing, of you know programs, uh, of our dependence on or societal dependence on uh, software and on uh, technology. Absolutely. It's incredible how important and applicable the research that you're doing and the programs that you're building are to uh, to industry, to academia, to our government. Can you speak? Fast forward us now uh, to what you do now. I mean, you have an insane number of publications for a very young assistant professor. You've been yeah. in the game for two and a half years now out of your PhD. Um, I assume maybe you did a postdoc in between or? The way that the the state of the field is right now, uh, there's a huge demand for cybersecurity for yes. very clear reasons. Um, as, you know, security issues keep popping up. Um, and, and start... the speed of creation of technology is exactly. so rapid yeah. that the security concerns increase alongside right. that speed. And actually, you know, an interesting thing um, there is the lack of security is a source of friction in the creation of technology. So there's only so fast that you can develop technology without thinking about security because mm -hmm. eventually there will be massive security issues that start hampering adoption. Yes. Things like uh, you know credit cards being leaked constantly. Mm -hmm. And what you see there is you know a couple of years ago everyone switched over from swiping to putting the chip in mm -hmm. to the card reader, right? Uh, for for making purchases. Uh, and that has some cost. It took uh, real resources to replace all these machines, yes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that was a security issue that drove behavior it. behavior change as well by behavior consumers, change, a willingness yeah. to adopt. And so what we saw very clearly is kind of a, a, a stumble, like a rock in the road that our progress hit because we didn't think things, things through and make them secure uh, from the beginning. At the same mm -hmm. time, it's impossible to make them secure from the beginning. You can't foresee all the issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, the, the pace of society and the pace of technology kind of uh, builds off of cybersecurity uh, or builds into a demand for cybersecurity. And that's why <clears throat> right now the way the market, the market and here I say like the demand for, for uh, cybersecurity professionals and uh, educational professionals and so forth is... Um, is it's possible to go straight from a PhD to a professorship. That, that's what I did. Sure, sure. Oh, absolutely. And, and you published a ton as a PhD student. You've published an amazing amount of research as a professor. Tell us about some of the work that you do and some of your uh, favorite sort of innovation stories around uh, your work. Sure. Um, so we do a wide range of research um, with a very clear kind of area of specialty. Uh, our lab at uh, Arizona State really does research in almost every aspect of cybersecurity. Um, to start with something that, you know, is, is was not traditionally an area of focus for me, we had a paper come out in October where we interviewed uh, security engineers and uh, security managers at companies and understood the contradictions between their view of the priorities for actual, you know, companies and and uh, academic institutions and government institu and and so forth um, in ensuring security. Right. So this is kind of a, an important thing to understand because as we develop security technology, developing it is uh, in some sense the easy part. You also have to get it adopted. You have to you know deploy all the chip readers, et cetera, et cetera, and yeah. convince people that this is important. And so uh, that's a, an area that traditionally I haven't done and that we've been getting into. Um, my 
area of uh, strong focus has been binary analysis. Yes. Yeah. And, and the idea, of course, is as... Yeah, break break down binary analysis because yeah. I think several of po- of the podcast listeners might be familiar with your field. I think especially folks tuning in from DEF CON or other audiences. But I think there's a, a large majority of people in the innovation community who maybe don't really know the inner workings of, of what happens in cybersecurity. Sure. So, yeah, tell us about binary analysis. So let's say I uh, write a computer program. Uh, I sit down and I uh, open up my development environment, or you don't need a development environment to write software. You can open up uh, Notepad and write software in Notepad. Um, You don't even necessarily need something that advanced. (laughs) But I sit down and I write a computer program. Traditionally, in the early 90s, let's say, when I was writing my first programs, when you write this uh, source code, you know, you, you type up a file that represents what a program should do, and then you use what is called a compiler to translate that into machine code, ones and zeros that a computer understands. So much of what you do takes, um, I mean, the amount of knowledge, not just historical knowledge, but mathematical knowledge, understanding of computers in terms of their infrastructures and methodologies to approach them, Um how do you translate the critical importance of your research to funding entities, to industry partners, to people who may not have that same expertise? Um, yeah, I'd love to know more about the kind of storytelling tactics you find yourself using. I, I love some of the metaphors you used when you were just describing it to me as, you know, PhD in English, you're in a, you're a PhD in computer science. We sort of speak different languages, but sure. um, but yeah. What what storytelling techniques do you find yourself using? What do you think is most important? So for me, the the important thing is to convey um, how I feel about the subject. Um, so when my grandma gave me that book, uh, it wasn't just informational. It was uh, like opening a whole world. Yeah. Right. So you you're reading about a world with very simple rules, right? Uh, A CPU works in extraordinarily simple ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there are a lot of complexities, especially in a modern processor, uh, out-of-order execution, a lot of uh, memory caching, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But really, from a very high level, it's extraordinarily simple. It pulls in bits. It interprets some of them as what to do and some of them as what what data to use while doing it, and Mm. then it does it. Um, But somewhere... At some point, between the physical components that a CPU is made up of, logic gates and and, and wires and and et cetera, and the computer program, there's some magical shift that happens at which point we say that is a computer. Because you don't say that about a calculator. Yeah, right, right. Um, right. You don't say that about, uh, I mean, modern calculators, of course, are computers, but you don't say that about like a a simple um, circuit that will add two numbers. The concept was really explored academically by Alan Turing um, back in, in, you know, the the middle of the last century. Um, And there's this kind of Turing barrier that a computer, that, that, that essentially defines when something that's not a computer becomes a computer. That's how I think of it. Okay. That barrier is magical. We don't really understand uh, philosophically, deep down inside, I feel there's a similar divide between that, between a non-computer and a computer, as there is between a computer and a human, right? So in, mm-hmm. in the push for AI, we are also facing this concept of at what point does a very, very smart machine okay. become sentient and 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 there's no real yes. answer even philosophically that we have in in a smaller way there's a similar uh, question in in the uh, step from not computing into computing to me that point that that threshold is, is there's some magic there and and the reason I do binary analysis is that is as close as you can get to that threshold hmm. from the uh, the other side, from the computing side. Yeah, uh, that's like the very core of computing is what is happening in your CPU, right on that level. Where if you go any further, it's just a bunch of logic gates. 
Right. There's there's right. no magic there to me. And then but but you step back across the threshold and suddenly you are talking about a machine that can emulate entire worlds uh, where people spend, you know, dozens of hours playing or something yes, like that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um so I try to convey that. Uh, in fact, I teach my courses um, from a very, from that uh, very base level, like um, bases and the, the very underpinnings, uh, the, the the foundations. Um, that's why I talk about the history of this. That's mm-hmm. why um, one of my uh, classes. So I teach this uh, kind of hacking course, essentially, where I. Um, teach students the various specific security issues that can occur at the binary level. Mm. Um, And I start out with, this is what the binary level is. So from the student perspective, one, I try to um, imbue this appreciation for for this this area, for for computability, for, for computing, right? And then... You have to go further. You have to uh, make them passionate about hacking as well, yeah. about cybersecurity. So then uh, from a certain perspective, you could view, and for a very long time, society did view hackers as purely, let's say, a nuisance or, or you know, renegades yeah. or something. Yeah, right. Um, and you see, saw this in, in as we established our early cybersecurity laws. Uh, the first DEF CON I was at, actually, there was a uh, security researcher that was talking about a flaw that he found in um, a certain document protection method. And he gave his talk on stage, uh, of course, and, and to, to whatever the, the, the crowd at DEF CON. And then he stepped down and he was arrested right there. I was so this is a burning question mm-hmm. that I have about your field, your work. How do you make the decision on what to share, what to publish, what not to share, whether to reveal your identity or not if you're doing this kind of work? Right. Uh there definitely are anonymous security researchers, for example, right? There are even anonymous security researchers in that show up in academic work. Um, I, I've read a paper Fascinating. Um, that w- where the author list, of course, we have, you know, in academia, authorship is our, our kind of uh, currency, essentially. Yes, so, yes. so you have your uh, your author list and, and one of the names is literally anonymous. Ah, right? And that's yeah. uh, really interesting because uh, there's, you know, as as you said in the beginning, uh, you looked at my publications, and those publications are on my uh, Google Scholar profile yeah, or whatever, yeah. because I'm an author on there. And then and 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 that. Do, has do this you have effect. any anonymous publications? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't admit to that. But, um, <laughs> anonymity has to work both ways. In order to work, yeah, you have to yeah, uh, yeah. you have to not be able to tell from the publication to the person, but also from the person to the publication. <laughs> but um but, but yeah, tell us how this 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 term, this hacking, you know, today I think hackathons are very popular inside innovation communities. I see them we see them all the time. Uh, it's an expectation. It's a playful kind of invitation to solve big problems, <laughs> uh, to sort of use the power of hacking for good. Yeah. How um, has that transformed? And I mean, I'm sure there are still, connotations of fear around it as well. So hacking has two meanings, right? And there are actually two kind of competing meanings. One meaning of hacking is um, hackathons, right? And and that is uh, the more the meaning that you you hack something together, right? You you grab something that was meant for one purpose, uh, you grab something else that was meant for purpose B, and you put this thing for purpose A, thing for purpose B together to accomplish C, right? Okay. And that is uh, what generally hackathons uh, do. Gotcha. That's still uh, computer uh, an art in computer science, right? It's still right. But, inside the world that you live in. But you, it? well, I've seen other people do it in playful ways. Yeah, just like sort of with art or right, exactly. creation. Yeah, in, in that see. perspective, you could have a hackathon of uh, engineering, right? Mm-hmm. You could have a hackathon of dance. Yeah, yeah, um, true. Or for sure, you can have a hackathon of film. You take two, you know, some a uh, number of of 
films together and you hack them together. Gotcha. You you you, you splush them and and end up with some interesting uh, result. Right. Is the term hackathon used in your world? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we operate on the second level of hacking, the or the the second meaning of hacking, and that that is you know. Um, when you hack into something, yes, right? So that yes. is Penetrate you. You the take, system. yeah, you take something that is meant for purpose A, and by uh, approaching it in a way that it was even possibly explicitly intended not to be used, you turn it to purpose B. Um, that is a much more. Uh, so that's the cybersecurity meaning of hacking. Um, it's it's breaking into computer systems or or breaking a system in a way that you you kind of uh, realign it to a different purpose. That could be you know breaking into uh, you know some large companies. Um, credit card processing system to turn it into a credit card harvesting system, oh, right, 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 and, and so right. forth. Um, Again, the powers of good or evil. Right. Ex do, do you teach ethics in your yeah, programs? Yeah, we, we, every class has to have at least a, an ethical component um, uh, or really should have an ethical component, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are kids we're teaching, and mm -hmm. sometimes they uh, don't, think things through. Um, so you have to be very explicit. Those neural pathways are still deepening. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be extremely explicit. I, I've seen in, in the area like of, of, of CS, not necessarily in ASU, um, kids do something stupid and get expelled and, and uh, sure, sure. really uh, set back their their uh, success like that. Well, and um, even some of the most famous founders now, like Zuckerberg, sort of got off to... Uh, uh, what's the word? I don't want to say a rough start because it's also kind of the thing that proved his capability. But you know, hacking into Harvard's system at the time, right. uh, So, yeah, it's 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 a balance, right? You you want to you need a net to kind of catch these kids and 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 make sure that you know they don't get thrown in jail. <laughs> um, it's the same reason. Like you have universities running their own police departments, right? And at, when I was a college student, I was outraged that, you know, the university is uh, somehow, I felt this was an oppressive thing, right? <laughs> but then I realized that the university police departments in part exist so that they can uh, kind of slap you on the wrist without this being <laughs> bigger a, <problem. laughs> a bigger problem. Uh, and and we have something like that in in academic cybersecurity, right? You you have you know you have the kid that breaks into your grading system, and uh, <laughs> has this happened to you personally? As it hasn't. <laughs> well, yes, actually. So um, I, I recently created a platform for That's cybersecurity incredible. education. Did the student get an A? Uh, yeah. Um, so so here's what I do. <clears throat> actually, in part to to teach this this ethical hacking lesson, um, I created a, a system that. Um, kind of underpins my course. It is a practice makes perfect based uh, concept where um, as I teach um, concepts of uh, binary security, it generates um, programs specific to the student and, and um, or like customized so no two problems are the same, uh, utilizing these concepts so that people... Uh, have to exercise uh, what they learned in practice, okay. right? And we, you know, the the course I teach right now, my main course has uh, like eight or nine modules going from this is how you use the command line on a on a modern computer to um, this is how you break into the um, what's called the kernels, the the very core of your operating system, you know, and and all the steps in between. Um, and it it's run on this uh, cloud-based system where students can connect. It'll auto-generate a challenge for them. They can solve the challenge. Uh, when you solve the challenge, you hack the system, you get access to a file that you don't have access to when you just connect up before solving the challenge. And then that file has a password for um, to redeem for grades. Right? Okay. So that's the the standard. Um, that's incredibly framework. fun. Yeah. It's and it's. It's really um, 
capture the flag applied very clearly to a, to education um, is exactly the format actually that cybersecurity competitions take. So when we create yes. uh, prompts for DEF CON, it's the same concept. You have a complex, much more complex, of course, <clears throat> computer system that runs, that, that we deploy and, and run and competitors have to break into it and steal information and, and exchange that information for points. One of my most vivid and favorite memories as a kid was being at summer camp in the middle of the woods, breaking up into teams and playing capture the flag and hiding your flag so that no one could find it, creating a jail, you know, trying to break through without anyone seeing you cross the perimeter, grab the flag and run back. So um, tell us about how that game style or that gaming sort of method is used inside the world of hacking. So this is why I want to ask you, tell us about the order of the overflow. Right. Um, if you can. <laughs> so, so How that was, mysterious is this organization? It's, it's fairly. It's I'm fairly, just teasing you. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, we have some anonymous people on it. Not anonymous, the hacking group, but anonymous, the, you know, not, not publicly identifiable. Um, <laughs> so we have, uh, we started out, uh, you know, I started out playing with shellfish and so forth during my PhD, and then um, I became uh, just through sheer enthusiasm for CTF. <laughs> I, I became the captain of the team, um, and then I graduated. And and this is graduation is kind of a very traumatic experience, yeah. right? So you you spend uh, all this time uh, in a lab. You you live in the lab, right? Mm -hmm. If you um, you can do your PhD right in two ways. One, you can maintain a good work-life balance. I have a friend that at 5 p.m., um, he gets up uh, from his desk and he goes home. And he, he does his PhD like a, a, a good employee at a good uh, at, at a job. He shows mm -hmm. up at, at 8, he leaves at 5, mm -hmm. and he does the PhD. But while he's there, he's doing the PhD. Yes, yes. Or you can, and that's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Another good way to do it is you just live in the lab. Mm -hmm. And what this means is you work in the lab, but you also don't work in the lab, right? <laughs> and so that's what I did. Um, and when you do it that way, graduating is great because you've accomplished uh, something amazing. You have a you know, you know have a PhD, everyone starts calling you doctor and, and so forth. Um, but it's also extremely traumatic. Suddenly sure. you're essentially kicked out of your, of your home. You know, mm -hmm. I lived in that lab for right. seven years. There, yeah. there were... Uh, times when, uh, especially during the Cyber Grand Challenge, when I would just be in the lab 20 hours a day, literally, yes, yes. and then I would go home and I'd sleep for four. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. and and, and uh, you know, I I passed on the torch of of uh, captaincy and shellfish, um, <laughs> and I was at uh, Arizona State trying to kind of train people up and in, in hacking there um, along with my awesome colleagues, of course. Um, and then this opportunity came around and that the organizers of DEF CON CTF retired. Organizers retire roughly every five years or so. Um, it takes a lot to run and you really want to maintain uh, freshness, mm -hmm. right? So you get fresh, enthusiastic people every five years. Mm -hmm. That's great. So the organizers retired and there was a search for organizers. And I thought, I want to do this. this I want to. This is what my yeah. life has been working towards exactly. to this point. Exactly. This is, uh, this is incredible. So, so there was this yes. choice between, you know, just continuing to, to play with shellfish, operate at the height of the, of the um, hacking world uh, as a participant or move into that role of an organizer, organizer of, yeah. a, of 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 the uh, person pushing and 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 guiding the field. Yeah. Um and I felt that that was a very good role from an academic perspective too. Yes, absolutely. Right? It really models how you've described the way that you learn to embed values and teach students and mentor students yeah. into this field. So it's it's kind of neat to see your transition from PhD student into professor also kind of transformed how you engage at DEF CON and the, the impact you make there. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and these competitions are fierce. I've watched I watched some YouTube videos. It's really fun to go on YouTube and look at DEF CON uh, CTF and and see some of the the ways that it works and some of the strategies. Just like it's it's neat to see. It's it's a lot of like young young people talking about what it's like. And I think there's still kind of a hush-hushness even on those videos to oh, yeah. not reveal too much. You don't want to re- reveal too much of your strategy because then someone else might hack that next year. So Yeah. And not even next year. I mean, we've had, uh, um, there have been social engineering attacks during a game. Ah. Um, we had uh, teammates that uh, for whatever reason didn't look like hackers and they would just walk around and they would you know oh what are you working on uh you know ah. they would they uh, sit down and start you know talking to the other teams and the other teams would be like oh yeah we're doing blah 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 oh. blah 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 like oh <laughs> human cool. hacking <laughs> human hacking absolutely i mean uh, other it's an old archaic art form <laughs> exactly it's always the weakest link there are teams that that did even crazier things i've heard of uh people like cutting network cables and splicing in uh to analog other teams analog hacking cables. analog <laughs> hacking it happens a lot one year uh when it was still legal now this is illegal um we had a <laughs> we had a a little robot that would spin around a wireless antenna and as it spun the wireless antenna it would uh perform what's called a deauthentication attack, right? And so every three seconds, we would disconnect every single person around except for us. Oh, uh, my god! From wireless. And there were teams that were relying on wireless internet and we mm-hmm. would, you know, uh, the next day we, we walk around and there's one specific team that they had all brand new matching uh, wired uh, network cables <laughs> because they just they couldn't deal with that that you know disconnection that you So frustrating. Um, yeah, and so so uh, actually the next year, so that was the last year that was legal. Now do these deauthentication attacks count as um, jamming, which is not not legal in America? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, so there, there are all of these these hacking things. But anyways, um, we uh, we decided to go for it. Uh, me, uh, my my uh, colleague Adam um, at ASU, a fellow professor, um, we sat down and we said, "All right, we're gonna do this. This is gonna be an awesome way to contribute to the community. An yeah. awesome way to um, also." Uh, evangelize to people that, hey, ASU is serious about cybersecurity, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I can actually elaborate on that because we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of a lot of uh, entities inside Arizona State University. That I, I was going to ask you, you know, so so the heart and soul of this podcast is to think about the role that storytelling plays mm-hmm. in the speed of innovation. Mm-hmm. How did you get buy-in at an academic institution for leading the world's most right. uh, competitive right. <laughs> so hacking game our um roles as professors is education but it's also um the development of the kind of the future of the field yeah and the way you do that is through research and through what's called lumped under service um yeah. what you do is you um form committees that decide um the proceedings of conferences, mm-hmm. right? So the publication process is actually fairly grueling. Mm-hmm. You write yes, your paper, yeah. you submit it, and then some uh, double-blind, uh, so anonymous reviewers. group of reviewers say your paper is crap, and then <laughs> you uh, revise and, and resubmit. Yeah, and then you do that again, and then a year later it's it, out. <laughs> exactly, and so so that anonymous group of uh, reviewers, uh, they're, they're typically professors in the field. Yeah. Um, and we um, presented this in a very similar way to the university. We said, look, we want to push forward the state of the art of applied cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. And we want to do this because it'll demonstrate that what we are doing here at ASU is really leading the field. Yeah. Right. And so suddenly you have uh, not just publications coming out of it, which is awesome, not just real world applicable um prototypes and tooling, which we also uh, try to focus on uh, at ASU, which is awesome. But you also have this event, this very unique uh, thing that is kind of the the world championship of hacking. Yeah. And ASU can help make this a reality. And Mm -hmm. the amazing thing about ASU is uh, 
it's it's so ASU styles itself as the new American university and this um originally meant uh, a difference in approach to um, admission right so ASU actually tries to admit as many people as possible. We're, I think, the only university whose uh, demographics exactly match the gram- demographics of the state of Arizona, right? So, wow. so minorities and yes, and and, yes. and uh, so forth. Prioritize inclusivity. Yes, exactly. Uh, extreme ex- inclusivity. There, there are students I have that are brilliant that could only go to college because um, because of ASU. That's right, amazing. which is which is super yes. cool, um, and it's 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 challenging on on the face of it. Uh, a typical university, they they actually want to be exclusive, right? Because also part of the measure of uh, university rankings is how few people you admit, mm. how low your admission rate is. I right, see. so so the lower yeah. the admission rate, it's not the only measure, of course, right? But it is a measure, and it uh, impacts your overall score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so so it's it, it's a different approach, but but. As part of this uh, reevaluation of what it means to be a university, um, ASU also has looked at what is this, the place of a university in its society, mm-hmm. right? And and this is, I think, a perfect opportunity to show what place a university can take in a society um, by by helping lead this event. And the event is. I mean, incredibly complex uh, to organize. I mean, it, it. I can't even imagine. It's <laughs> and and not just even it's deciding a, how to structure the game itself, but yeah. then recruit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a- everything. So you have um, just in, in insane amounts of complexity. I think DefCon CTF, just the CTF, takes something like one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to uh, sure. to run and. Um, DefCon, the conference. How many hours do you think collectively for oh, the organizers? And that's not counting the hours. That's not yeah. counting the um, yeah, time. Collectively for the organizers, uh, we basically don't exist for um, the month of uh, July, June, and May. <laughs> right? It's just it's just we don't exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. We take uh, April uh, kind of off. At the beginning of April is uh, the qualifying event. Right now. We don't exist. We're just preparing the qualifying event, right? Uh-huh. Like it's it's, and there's about a dozen people on the order of the overflow, yes. it, and they're not all ASU. It's just uh, mm-hmm. me, me and my yeah. my colleague. We have uh, a couple of students um, um, at ASU, uh, and then uh, there are these uh, kind of mysterious other individuals. Um, How do you collaborate virtually? On it's, something so important without the fear of getting hacked. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, what I like to tell people, which is completely false and, and just just bravado, is is we are the people that people should fear. You know, <laughs> so uh, I, I have students that are nervous to go to DefCon, and they're like, uh, Jan, I, I don't know if I should take my my my, my laptop. I don't know if I should. And I'm like, no, don't worry. You are who they should be afraid of. <laughs> Uh, but um, you just <laughs> that kind should of, be the slogan for Tom. yeah, exactly. I am who they should be afraid of exactly. At some point, you 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 just just say you know you only live once. Just yolo it all <laughs> the way to, to DevCon. DevCon. So that's that's how we collaborate. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really it's so incredible. I I'm thinking uh, you know just a couple of takeaways as we wrap up are. You got buy-in from the university by aligning that work with the overall mission Mm -hmm. of the organization. Mm -hmm. That is applicable to innovators or hackers within industry, within academia, within anyone who's operating inside of any kind of culture or organization, figuring out what the mission is and making sure there's alignment in how you're pitching that possibility and that idea. But you also need um, the institution. So there are two parts of that. There's the kind of uh, innovator, so to say, like the the person that is making the pitch to the institution. But there's also the institutional part. Um, And we got really lucky, again, at at ASU. We had the institutional part. Um, It's uh, uh, many different parts of ASU helped out. Uh, The the kind of core one is um, what's called the Global Security Initiative, GSI. Um, And it's a part of ASU whose goal is to Increase the real world cybersecurity, security in general, but this in this, of course, cybersecurity uh, impact of, of our research and our work at the university. I mentioned DEF CON CTF takes uh, about $150,000 a year to run. Uh, over half of that, DEF CON the conference, 
um, uh, actually uh, uh, provides. So, you know, things like hotel rooms, admission yeah, to the conference, sure. that, that adds up quite a lot. Uh, but there's things like servers, uh, things like um, food. <laughs> Yeah, for, sure. for the organizers, uh, et cetera, that that uh, costs quite a lot as well. Um, and uh, ASU managed to, you know, somehow find funding for this. So that that's been incredible. Yes, um, yeah, definitely. So what I would say to to that comment of that that innovator takes two to tango, kind of right. So you have the the innovator needs to um, align the 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 mission and and show how uh, this can move forward, but you need to either have an institution that or an organization that uh, will meet you uh, in the middle, uh, or you need to make that uh, place within your organization. I love that. I love that advice. Do you have any other advice for, you know, for for professionals or young professionals or students who want to become hackers? Do you have advice in terms of, how they can communicate that desire, how, yeah, I guess I'm just curious if you have advice for them as they also figure out not just the art form of hacking, but the communication that's involved in doing that well. Yeah, uh, that is a very good question. Uh, There are three things I would say. One is um, to keep in mind that the world isn't just cyberspace. Uh, one of the biggest uh, limiting um, factors, I would say, that I see is people that focus 100% on the virtual um, and forget that they live in in meat space, right? And yeah. with you know, with other people, uh, shellfish wouldn't have been the biggest, uh, you know, the longest running, the the coolest CTF team, if it wasn't for a collection of individuals that weren't just proficient hackers, uh, but were also proficient human beings, right? So, you know, my yeah. advisor is, is a great example of this. Um, he's uh, super capable of creating this social environment that allows shellfish to thrive as well. Um, and other teams uh, don't. You you have teams, and I've seen them uh, come and go, that you know, a collection of uh, super good hackers who never talk to each other, who never talk to other people, who never you know propagate their skills, and then when they stop hacking, the team is gone. And that's also fine, right? Maybe, you know, this uh, but it, and going it could kind of slow down the industry overall, exactly. like the, the community overall, yeah. and the progress of innovation. Yeah, and so there, there are people. That memory gets lost then if you don't. The memory keep gets it going. lost. There's no. Um, there, there are people that have that went to UCSB because of shellfish, right? And 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 that's how you start, you know, pushing forward the community. And I hope there are people that, uh, and in fact, there are people that have come to ASU because of the order of the overflow. Um, and uh, that have gone to, I mean, like I said, the order of the overflow is not just uh, ASU. We, we just happened, we, we created it there. But I mean, I have uh, colleagues, uh, fellow professors that are also on the order of the overflow uh, as far as uh, your common France, yeah, right? And, yeah. and, and, and so forth. Um, two is that you can actually start hacking now, right? You don't need a formal education. And I'll uh, now give a caveat with number three, but you don't need... A formal education. I started hacking in high school, right? Yeah. You can look up enormous amounts of material online. Um, one thing that's coming down the pipeline is this class that I described earlier. Um, I'm actually making it available for free online, uh, including already the um, exercises are online, but the lectures are just in uh, slide form. So I need to record lectures and put it, but that'll be like a, a turnkey uh, resource to just just roll forward with binary um, security. Uh, and I'm happy to share a link to that course in the yeah. show notes. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, it's also very easy to remember. It's uh, So there's a, a term for exploiting something, poning, uh, and that's P-W-N uh, from, I think, owning. You know, I owned that server, so I pwned it. <laughs> uh, so pwn.college. PWN.college, super easy to to remember too. Awesome. Um, and uh, so, like I said, right now the all the exercises are up, but not the 
um, I mean, and all the lecture notes, but but that's still hard to approach. So uh, over this next semester, I'll record everything uh, and put that online. Um, but there, that that's just one thing. There are a million different resources um, mm-hmm. on on how to start hacking. I think there's an association that most hackers are guys. Mm-hmm. Culturally, your your mother and your grandmother were the people who sort of introduced you to this world. Right. I'm really fascinated by that. So. Do you see that culture? Is that true of the hacking culture? Do you see that changing? What are your thoughts on some of the gender disparities? Right. So I I would say, uh, first off, uh, also, to be fair to my dad, in case he listens to this podcast and feels excluded, uh, my dad really shout out <laughs> yeah, encouraged me to move in the direction of cybersecurity professionally. I I didn't actually believe that you could do it as a living, um, and oh. in, in you know back when I was graduating college in the mid two thousands. It wasn't very clear that you could. Right, right. But, right. This was said, all this, forming. Yeah, he said, "This is the future. You you should go for it." How right? did he know that? Um, he was also in the computer science uh, area. Um, uh, he, my dad's a mathematician, but you know he drifts between more applied and less applied uh, math, and the more applied math uh, tends to be computer science. Now, did um, you grow up in Russia and then move here, or did I moved here when I was eight? Okay. Um, so I. I at my very early childhood in Russia, and then I grew up in Arizona. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, All right. We got the dad shout out. <laughs> exactly. We got the dad shout out. So uh, you're absolutely right about that perception, um, and an, it's a major issue. So um, as a whole, computer science, I don't have the, the exact numbers, but um, it's something like 90% male, mm. and cybersecurity specifically is the worst of the subfields. Really? It's something like 95 to 98% male. In the entire competitive hacking community, let's say at, let's say at DEFCON CTF last year, uh, there were probably so there were sixteen teams that made it to finals. Uh, each team had, on average, let's say twelve people um, of that whole. Uh, group hundreds of people. There were probably four girls. Yeah, uh, and that's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's something that the community is really struggling with. The there are things individual people can do to make uh, a difference. One thing is uh, explicit outreach to. Uh, underrepresented groups in computer mm-hmm. science, yeah. um, and actually, it's 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 even even worse than just uh, a lack of uh, women in computer science. There's just a lack of uh, diversity diversity of in color general. Or yeah. Other, yeah, is it mostly Caucasian? Um, I would say in every major area, it's mostly that major area, right? Okay. So in in the U.S., um, the community is. I would say it roughly follows the demographics of higher education um, minus, for some reason, uh, women, which is bizarre because most of the early names we talked about were women, Ada Lovelace, Grace Hopper, right, right. Uh, et cetera. And they created this field, and then the field became uh, dominated by men somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of reasons to it. There right, are reasons right. that I see that History are very, of- very clear, stupid reasons that are extremely frustrating mm-hmm. um, uh, that fall under this uh, horrible category of, you know, boys will be boys or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Where you get a group of um, men, and so it's unclear how that started, but now it's propagates. You get a group of men uh, together um, in a hacking team, and uh, there are you know, a non-inclusive jokes flying around, et cetera, et cetera. And it's gotcha. something that- so Even the culture can be exclusive. Even, even the culture. And so when I said that um, you can't ignore that you're in a, a human space when you're hacking, it's not just a virtual space. That's one of the things I mean. It takes work to make sure that your hacking team is uh, not a team where- um, you know, inappropriate comments are uh, go lightly, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's very easy to stumble into a place online where that is the case. Since if hacking teams really live online, 
there's some there's there's some correlation between you know living mostly online mm-hmm. and uh, trash talk. <laughs> trash uh, trash talk. There is okay trash talk, you know, but there and there's not okay trash talk. Yeah, and the yeah. not okay trash talk is really I think what what really harms inclusivity. Um, and honestly, just just that makes a big impact. Yeah, I think absolutely. at ASU um, in our group. And I, I should have these numbers, but I don't have them off the top of my head. And a group of roughly uh, 50 researchers, let's say, we have something like eight or nine um, female computer scientists, mm-hmm. right? That is unheard of numbers yes. in cybersecurity, yeah. right? I would say out of the big labs that I know of, mm-hmm. and I don't know the exact makeup of every big lab uh, in the world, but out of the big labs I know of, we are probably the most gender balanced. That's eight or nine out of fifty. I mean, that's horrible, right? Right. right. But for for computer but science as a whole, a, yeah, 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 almost twenty percent is is yeah. crazy high. Yeah. So do call yourself a hacker. Yeah, absol- absolutely. Don't, don't wait for someone else to yes put that badge. Yes, on. I think that's true for all innovation. I'm yeah. so for me as a writer too. Do call yourself a writer. Yeah. If you sit around and, and wait to be awarded an yes. award or be published in your perfect journal. Yeah. That's not uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it goes for everything, and goes for for hacking. Uh, absolutely. Um, I started hacking in high school with with no uh, real formal uh, training or anything. I had a, a an awesome uh, high school computer science teacher um, who and introduced me. And your mom me. too. Yes, yes, and and my mom, and then my grandma, and, and so forth. In terms of your the, grandma was you, also no, she gave me that book. <laughs> my, gra- <laughs> my grandma's a mathematician. Uh, well, that's pretty close. But it's, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and 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 you know, I I was I just kind of rolled forward on my own, and you can totally do that. There's uh, there is some magic, but it's magic that no one understands, not even the experts, right? So you just I love you just that. start start pushing in. Um, the third thing I would say, and you can kind of see it from my trajectory, is I was able to start on my own, but I wasn't able to finish the 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 trajectory into uh, yeah. being a hacker on my own. For that, I needed to go to graduate school. Um, and what I would say is if you are out there and there was some excitement that you had about computing, um, about hacking, or even about just anything to do with computing, and this applies to any field, really, mm-hmm. and you kind of lost it or you it, 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 it's, it's a little elusive as you're, you know, uh, finishing up uh, your undergrad and and looking at the real world, or you're at the real world and uh, you know looking at your nine to five. Um, think about grad school, right? Uh, at ASU, we're always looking for students. Uh, in fact, with the the demand in cybersecurity, everyone yes. is always looking yes. for students. But there are these uh, institutions that are very. Um, committed to this real world um, applicable uh, thing um, like ASU, right? One thing that we have, and th- I, I don't mean this to to be like a sales pitch, uh, what I started at Arizona State is an apprenticeship program. So if you are interested, just shoot me an email. We have basically an open program where we bring promising people in for a research apprenticeship. Awesome. Someone reaches out and they say, hey, I want to know what it's like to do cybersecurity research, to um, compete in CTF with top hackers. Uh, My students still play every CTF. Uh, I play every CTF that's not a, well, not every CTF, but I play CTFs that aren't (laughs) DEF CON qualifiers because that's conflict of interest otherwise. (laughs) Um, And so you can, you can, Shoot over this email, and we have programs where you basically come in for six months. You're paid as a graduate student, but it's uh, low risk. Uh, you just try to understand what research is like and if it's good for you. And then if it is, then you can apply to grad school. That's great. So how how can listeners get in touch with you? Uh, Jan S, Y-A-N-S, at ASU.edu. Or, um, 
What you, social media are, are you on? Social media? Uh, yeah, Watch? mostly Twitter. Yeah. So if you uh, want to get a hold of me, um, Zardus at Twitter. Z a r d u s. Awesome. That's my uh, uh, hacker handle. Jan, I am so excited about everything we talked about. I think that the innovation community is hungry to know what's going to happen next in cybersecurity. It's a top innovation industry. I, uh, it's really cool to hear all the underworkings and the sort of playful culture that exists within it. I think that's a really unique uh, aspect of that particular industry. Mm-hmm. And so thank you for yeah, being absolutely. on the podcast. Happy to be here. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 